first of all, when Mike asked me a topic, he said passing. I was like, oh my goodness, what do I want to talk about passing? But it really challenged me to think. But the first thing I said well, to myself was, it is not just passing. We have to put the receiving piece in. And as you probably can tell, I was an old football offensive coordinator. So, and I started off coaching football, being the receivers coach. So I know a lot about receiving and getting open. And I also know a lot about a quarterback throwing. So there'll be a lot of analogies around that, but I do think it's uh, it's applicable to what we're doing. And anybody who knows me, I, I have to start off with a story because that's just who I am and how I teach. But I'm going to tell you my pumpkin story. And pumpkin story starts with, it was my grand, my mother or my, or she was the grandmother to my niece. She was babysitting my niece and I happened to be there. And she was about two years old and keeping her occupied. She pulled out this coloring book, had a picture of a pumpkin. And so my niece grabbed a crayon and she just colored it, just colors all over it. And my mother said to her, said, oh, Kellen, you are the best colorer I've ever seen. I just love how you color. And she took the picture and she put it on the fridge. And in fact, it, that was on that fridge for like 50 years, probably that picture as my niece grew up. Fast forward, my niece is now in primary school, kindergarten, and she's given the same pumpkin picture and asked to color it. So she colors the pumpkin. And now the teacher puts a mark or a grade to it and says on it, Kellen has great understanding of color selection, can work on staying within the lines. And I know she can do this. That was her feedback. Fast forward, she's now in high school and she's taken art class. And so she colors this pumpkin and it's one of the first assignments she gets around, you know, October. And, and now the art teacher gives her feedback and says, Kellen, you missed the assignment. The assignment was to give co uh, contrast, texture, and shading to the pumpkin. I want you to redo it. And I know you can do this. You just have to practice some more. Okay. Uh, oh, well, Mike, by, by, by the way, I think there's, a, there's another screen layering your bottom right of the presentation. Oh there you see it now mike yeah that's perfect thank you okay. so so the point is it's this whole idea of going from an, a novice to an expert and a lot of this i've been thinking a lot by reading doug lemoff's new book which i think is excellent it's one of the best books on teaching as a coach and and the key is is when she was first learning to color we just wanted her to color some more so we're really making her excited and passionate about coloring so when we're dealing with the novice, we're not getting too detailed in our feedback and over coaching them. We're just getting real excited that they're here and they want to do it. And picture a mother teaching or a father teaching a young child. We're not telling them to go left, right. No, no, your elbow had to be bent. They're just so excited to see this child walk. The second one, we kind of want to encourage her. So we're telling, hey, you did a great job on the color, but we're starting to give a little more direction into how she can get better but we're giving her an assurance that I know you can do this. But eventually when it gets to be an expert, we have what I call that bandwidth feedback. We're only given feedback on certain points of emphasis. And the point of emphasis here was you needed to give some content or some texture to this and some shading. So I don't have to go and say, oh, you were wonderful. You were great. But by the way, could you put this in? We, we cut the fluff out. And I, what I see a lot of when we're getting into our coaching is we still have this thing about, oh, good job, way to go, attaboy, you're just doing such. But we never are, we're afraid almost to give them that direct feedback. And I think that's going to be important when we're teaching a skill like passing or any skill. You have to be willing to give that direct feedback on your points of emphasis. I really would challenge you to take this uh, YouTube link and just if you go Austin's Butterfly, it's one of the best. On, on coaching there, there is. So Austin was a grade one student. He was asked to draw this butterfly. And then his classmates gave him feedback to help him draw the butterfly. So this is what it looked like. So you can see his first picture was, you know, it was more what he all, what he thought a butterfly looked like in his mind. But then over successive feedback, he eventually ended up with that, that last picture. And this is a, a, a little fall in grade one. 
The key was, first of all, they didn't give them fluff. They didn't say, oh, Austin, you're the best. Oh, we love you, Austin. Oh, you do, you're such a great artist, Austin. They gave him specific details and how he could do it. But more importantly, he accepted the feedback and really want to try to do better. So it takes time to become an expert. But there is a role of a coach. There is a role of feedback. There is a role of, of having a point of emphasis and putting your attention to some details. And that's, I think, one of the things we've really got to look at. So Doug Lemoff talks a lot with this, and I've had a few of my ideas to it too, but he says that novices tend to see superficial details. They don't really know what they know. They don't really know where they're supposed to look. They don't know the, the main points of emphasis. Okay, so when you fill them up, as, as Peter said, the PhD, you really mess them up because they already don't know what they're supposed to pay attention to. Now you've given them 20 things to pay attention to. You're really going to confuse them. Whereas the experts tend to see concepts or the underlying principles. And I think what Peter told us, I just want to know if she's right or left-handed. I don't need the PhD description of all these things I got to do. I just want to know the underlying thing. What does she like to go left? Does she like to go right? I'll figure it out from there. They also know where to put their attention. That's important. They know where to put their attention. And are we helping athletes on this journey and learning how to do that? So a novice is going to need some more instruction or, or structure. You're going to have, it's like the cook. You're going to have to give them the cookbook. This is where we need you to be on the floor. The geography, as Peter said, here's where you need to position yourself on defense. We need to start with some structure. Okay, they need a clear example, a clear picture of what they're trying to do. This is what it's going to look like. And there has to be a simple, clear language, not a whole bunch of, and as it grows, we can be more detailed, but start off with something that's very clear, a tweet, sound bites, very important. Whereas the expert can be more creative. They can be more like the chef. Now they have all these concepts they can blend those ingredients into fit who they are and the situation. But it's because they have that understanding of principles that they can do that. You don't become creative from, from having no understanding or knowledge. You have to have that foundation first. And then they can have a more expanded vocabulary. So we need to be a little more direct when they're first starting, provide clear expectations and how we plan how they're, we're going to monitor and how what the outcome is going to be. Whereas in the indirect, we can let the, the players take more ownership. Okay, So be thinking of this as I'm talking about as we're going through the skill. And again, expertise is context specific. I might be an expert on on-ball defense, but I might be a novice in running a ball screen offense. People make the assumption too often that, oh, she's played for five years. She must be an expert. That How many years you've played doesn't mean anything. I, I had players that played for me when I was young, and I know that I didn't turn them into an expert because I never really made them understand the underlying principles. I never made them really understand where they should be looking. I let them just pay attention to the superficial details their whole career. It wasn't until I learned that I had to start teaching them to understand the game that I could help them grow. The final little point is we sometimes forget the importance of self-confidence when we're teaching skills. And there was a study done at St. Evex University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. It's the place where our coach K, Steve Kinshelsky coaches. He's been there forever. Uh, but they did this study and what they did was they took all the elementary school girls in the, in the uh, elementaries in Antigonish. So it was about five elementary schools. And they took them all in their phys ed class and had them throw a baseball. And then they just said, she has bi proper biomechanical principles or she had problems with her biomechanical principles. The second thing they had was a psychologist came up with a test for, is she willing to take a risk in trying new things? We would call it growth mindset. They didn't have it then. So they looked at the, 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 these two things, could throw a ball and was willing to take a challenge. 
what they found was the players who had had good mechanics and growth mindset were more willing to take a risk. And why? Because someone had spent time with them, teaching them and practicing throwing. Usually their mother or their father or brother or sister would go out in the backyard and spend time. And it was that time with someone throwing the ball with me and learning. It wasn't time. None of them said I learned it from my phys ed teacher. It was because someone had taken the time and showed that they care. And I know, especially has been around the women's game most of my career, looking like a player, feeling like a player, that I have good mechanics and that I and I and no one's going to laugh when I throw a ball or no one's going to laugh when I shoot and, and means a lot. If a, if a young female player is in a, in a game and someone laughs at something that they do, she may not play again. She may never try that again. So I think there's an important part that sometimes we forget about the importance of confidence. I would say the same is for guys, but guys have just been told not to hide it better. But it still it still gets gets to them. Okay? So this whole idea of self-identity and how I look and how I feel is very, very important uh, in growing and, and teaching players. So where does pass and receiving fall? Well, first of all, as you know me, it's always going to be the context. Who, who we talk about, why are they playing? Why are we coaching them? What are we trying to achieve and how we're going to teach it? So it's always about context and it's always Goldilocks and the three bears. Too much, too little, just right. And it's finding that balance. And that's where the art comes in. Okay. I'm going to look at it from this idea of PVAD. So the first thing is, can we put them in a position where they can see and, and to pass and to receive efficiently? So there's, there's a position to pass, but can I be in a position effectively pass? So, so let's say we're talking about throwing the ball long on an outlet pass. If I'm stepping with the same foot and same hand, I'm probably not going to be able to generate as a younger player enough power to throw the ball long. Now, you take an NBA player, they could probably step with the wrong foot, no problem. But a young player needs to have some biomechanical principles. So I need to get them to understand how to be in that position. Second thing is, do they recognize patterns? This is where that expert starts to recognize a pattern. And if I start to recognize patterns, I'm going to start to see that pattern looks like I can throw that pass because they're open. Ooh, that pattern looks like they're not open. I have to help them recognize what is open and not open. I have to get them to be anticipating. And this is where it starts. Well, is that person going to be able to catch this? KYP is know your person, know your plays, know your plan. So do they, do they know who that teammate is? Can they start? To understand that oh that defender looks like they're going to jump they i know they like to jump the pass but this is a big one too are they willing to take the risk and does the environment allow them to take the risk i would say the biggest problem with players developing a passing as more creative or more is that coaches will not let them take a risk even though we may not say it it's our body language it's the result of when they make a pass and it's a turnover. And if, if it's always there's a consequence and it's transactional, they will learn not to take risks. And therefore, they never learn to make those passes that lead to those big advantage scores or create those fouls. They'll play the safe. They'll play safe. Okay. And then so that's why in the decision making, I have to make it a safe learning environment where it is OK to take risks where it's okay to be vulnerable, where it's okay that your teammates and your coaches are gonna support you. And if I don't create that, then I'm probably not gonna develop an expert or elite passer because they're gonna, again, play, play uh, trying to avoid turnovers. The other one is, is this whole idea of principles of play is so powerful. And that's what Peter was talking about is helping them understand the underlying concepts and patterns and where to put their attention. That's what I'm trying to do. So the positioning, so no matter what the situation, where should you position yourself? What's, how, how, do we, how do we expect the ball and the players to move in this situation? And then what's the timing and the sequencing of what's going to happen? 
And this timing and sequencing one is crucial in passing because you have very small windows of opportunity to make and complete passes. And if we haven't helped players understand that timing is when they lose the opportunity to make that pass. So this is just a random picture off the internet of continuous 11 player fast break. We've all run it, great drill, great drill. For this context, I think it's a great drill. The pros, it, early in training, it's great. They're getting to run, they're learning the spacing on the floor, they're learning to find the open player. The defense is learning for someone to protect the basket, someone to guard the ball. And as Peter said, there's that, someone has to help, someone has to drop. Very good for young players. And they get some conditioning and it's fun. You get to run up and down the floor, score and everybody handles the ball, you get appropriate amount of rest. But this is where I would say there's some cons to it. And the number one is, it lacks the pattern recognition that I need to make at a higher level. Because I'm seeing the same pattern every single time. It is also a pattern that doesn't happen very often where there's two defenders in an eye and there's me in the middle with the ball, two people on the wing. I can watch a whole lot of games on Synergy, YouTube or live and I don't see that pattern very often. So there's the transfer is not there, the pattern recognition. And so therefore the underlying cues are not the same. The cues that I have to learn to put my attention on are not the same. And so therefore the underlying concepts may not always be the same, okay? And can I take risks? It, it's basically, it's, it's the same thing over and over. So I'm not given a, an opportunity to try some different things. Now, having said that, I can load this drill and add in different constraints and stuff to make it tougher and, and load the athlete. But eventually I still think you run to a point where the roadmap is not the same. And so to me, this is more what you see in a game. You see these random, it looks random, but you don't see this, this structured positioning of everybody on the floor. And now players need to read this, recognize this pattern and make sense of it. That novice, this is gonna be and they're going to see something superficial. They're going to see that, oh, there's a referee down there in the corner. That's what they might see. <laughs> you have no idea what they're going to see. Whereas an expert will start to put um, some decisions to this. They will know, oh, with that pattern, this is what I can do. So what pass do I see? And, and what do I expect the receiver to do? That's going to be a big one. Is she going to? Just let me just go up here for a second. I'm gonna just grab this. So is she gonna, is she thinks she can make this pass right here, right in here, and then that she's expecting her to run into that? That'd be to a big advantage. Or is she just gonna make this pass here to this player? Or is she gonna throw a hard cross court pass over here to this player because she sees that this player's got her head turned? So, so it's all about, Again, what is she going to see? Whoops. How will I make the pass? Am I going to throw a hook pass, a baseball pass, a hard bounce pass with reverse spin on it, a chest pass? And, and can that receiver actually catch that pass? Oh, I don't think she can catch it. I better not throw it to her. But oh, my other post, yeah, she could catch it. Do I trust my teammates and do they trust me? One of the things as a receiver is I'm not going to work hard if I don't get rewarded. So I've always used to like to tell my, my point guard, give the ball to the post early in the game. They'll run all day for you. But if we go three possessions and they've been busting their butt running, eventually they're going to stop running. So even if we don't think they're going to score, give them the ball early in the game to encourage them to keep running. And that's what can happen a lot is, is because passing is a, a big part of your relationship. And an old mentor of mine, Renato Pasquale used to call it, does your teammate give you a dirty or a clean pass? If they give you a dirty pass, they're basically saying, I don't really respect you or I'm just giving you the ball because I can't do anything else And here. You take it now. 
But if they give you a clean pass, it's because they know you can do something with it. And the great players, it's almost like they're a pool player. They're using their pass to bounce the ball off you into the basket or to bounce the ball off you to pass to another person because they understand the shot, the, the, the pattern, and they're just using that pass as a way to get to what they're seeing to you might get the final shot. So, and that only happens with precise precision passing. And then does my, do I trust my coach and does my coach trust me? I mean, I know a lot of coaches put restrictions in such as we never bounce pass in transition, no bounce passes here. Uh, you're not allowed to throw this pass. Well, what happens if you decide to throw the bounce pass and it doesn't work? Does that mean you're automatically pulled? What happens if you throw the bounce pass and it works? Do they let you keep doing it or they still say, hey, no more bounce passes. I know you got one got through, but you were lucky. I, I believe in some limitations, but I'll explain later on the difference between, I think, restrictions and limitations. And how might the defense disrupt us? This is always a big part in your passing. That's why, you know, I see coaches with the five on O practice and like, wow, look at us pass, look at the ball move. We zip, 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 zip. We get these reversals. But as soon as a defender goes in and, and, and disrupts, disrupts the reversal, all the timing and sequencing is gone. And so how might they disrupt? And can we still work on our timing and sequencing when we're being disrupted? So when I read the roadmap, what? might what might prevent me from seeing a pass well first of all it could be in a poor position a lot of times the poor position is a bad habit if you have a kid who cannot dribble without looking down at the floor well they're not going to see open people and see passes the biggest one i find with our age group players is they have a tendency to to narrow their focus especially as a defender gets on them and now they only see what's in their sagittal plane, the straight ahead of them. So, and that's that's a natural thing. That's why ball pressure, the closer I get to you, the more I get in your personal space, the more you narrow. And now they're only seeing things in this plane. And But yet the great passes are usually on the peripheral. It's your diagonal passes. Those are the passes that tear defenses apart. And so I have to help them understand how to position their head and their body so they can see the basket and more of the floor and not just see a narrow band in front of them. That is one of the most important things you've got to do with a young athlete is help them to expand their vision when they have the ball. Heads down, body position, and I have it. And then it's also, I may have put in restrictions and said, well, we never looked at the past that post. Well, right away, I'm never looking at the basket. And then all of a sudden somebody's wide open the basket and, and you're like, well, why didn't you throw it to Sally? Well, coach, you told us never to pass the ahead to the to the big. Well, if she's open, you should give it to her. So we got to be careful in how we restrict players. And then this poor positioning of the receiver. So they're not looking. So maybe right here, this player, she's not looking. Okay, uh, it could be. Uh, it could be that there's no window. So maybe our player over here. I can't see her because she's behind two defenders. So it's up to the receiver to create that window or there's no separation. So maybe our player in the, in the middle here, she's not separated. So I don't think she's open. She's not away from a defender. So it's up to that receiver to learn how to separate. And then it also always the disruption that the defense, the defense is just disrupting everything we're trying to do. Okay. And then there's comes, can I make the pass? Am I strong enough? I would contend that there's not a lot of, developmental female players that could take that ball off the dribble and pass that hard cross-court pass, okay? I would say, especially if she had to go with her left hand. And Dave Smart, who's been a, a legendary coach in Canada, and he's been known for his forced left defense, and people think it was mostly for forcing left for drives. It was mainly because people couldn't pass with their left hand that he forced left. It just took away so many options by the offense because they couldn't pass with their left hands, especially down on the baseline. Okay, mechanics. Do they have proper mechanics to generate the power that they need to? Or 
pivoting, pivoting is always a big bone of contention with me because pivoting is not a natural action. It's not something that our body does naturally where you restrict your movement and you have, we would normally like to go left, right, and move. But pivoting, if we're not teaching proper mechanics, a lot of players end up stepping, not pivoting, where they get off balance. And now if I step and then I, I want to come back to pass, I got to almost stand back up and I, I lose my effectiveness. But if I can learn to actually pivot, and this is where that new rule comes in, because we used to teach a lot of space pivoting, where I would actually pivot into the defender to prevent them from getting into me. But if I space pivot too aggressively, I'm now getting into that offensive cylinder. Okay. Can I put touch on it? In other words, in football, make it a catchable pass. When I was in high school, we had a quarterback could throw the ball like 60 yards. And at the start of the year, he was our starting quarterback. But as a receiver, you couldn't catch his passes because he, all he do is throw bullets. You'd be, have a five-yard pass and you'd trick your head off. Well, then our backup quarterback, he could only probably throw about 30 yards, but you couldn't, you couldn't help but catch it. Well, we went on to win the provincial title. It was mostly because he just threw his catchable passes. It was almost like you just had to put your hands up and just float right into them. Whereas the other guy was like, you could never, you'd break your thumbs or fingers trying to catch it. So is it catchable? And then does it lead to an advantage? That, that to me is, is, like I said, the great passer, it's like I say, they're playing pool. And I, I was very fortunate to have some very good point guards. And I used to tell them, look, your job is to bounce the ball off her hands in the basket. If you can make that kind of pass, that's, so that was like in a shooter, hit her in the pocket. And if it's on a layup, don't make her have to be a soccer, a soccer goalie. There's nothing worse than making me have to reach outside my body with two hands to save the ball. Give them something that they can anticipate and make that next, next decision. Okay, so again, am I going to block and trap the ball or am I going to use two hands? Well, if you're learning to seal inside, you need to learn how to block and trap because if you reach with two hands, you get narrow and now the defense can get in there. So you have to really help them understand and then there's some timing and sequencing when you're blocking and trapping is when do you release the other arm to go get the ball? If you do it too soon, you release the defense. Okay, am I gonna stop or dribble on the catch? Am I gonna catch and put it down right away or am I gonna be stopping? And how do I maintain? When I catch this, can I maintain PVED? Can I catch and have vision right away or do I have to do an action, a pivot or get my balance before I can see? And then that should lead into, I like to call it now the NBA, the next best action. If I can catch my pass and then make that pass pass or that pass drive, right away the next best action without having to freeze the ball, that's going to be an important part of how we're going to teach our passing. And then there's this whole one of the trust. So she's going to be thinking here, if I throw this spinning bounce pass, can she going to catch that? Uh, probably not. Okay, and will she will she try to get open? And that's that again. Is she is she going to work hard? She says, well, she never throws that pass. So why am I even going to go down there? She never throws it. And what's the consequences if I try that pass and goes out of bounds? And do I look over the bench and already there's a sub coming in? Well, then I'm never going to try that pass. And will I go against the restriction? The coach said never throw a bounce pass to the post. So when I go against it, I was fortunate to have a player who, who taught me that because she, she would go against my restrictions and she, and she taught me a lot that, you know what, don't be putting restrictions on her because she would prove me wrong all, all the time. In fact, she loved the challenge of proving me wrong. And I learned a lot from that that made me a better coach. And then again, how are they going to disrupt it? And how do I counter what their defense is doing? And always, how do we be deceptive? How do we add changing speeds change in direction, and of course, in passing, how do we add fakes? How do we add fakes to counter the disruption of the defense? And that can be eye fakes, ball fakes, body fakes, anything that can disrupt. Fight. And I think that's one of the most important things we, we have to be adding into our game is teaching players, changing speeds, changing directions, and faking to create separation. That's the purpose of a fake, to get the defense off you so you can shoot, so you can pass, or you can drive. Okay, so 
learning environment. For me, instead of a continuous three on twos, this is more what I would do. And this is what I do is I recreate random situations. Now I'm going to a very static. Normally I would never start static. We would start with some kind of flow. And I always like to say, if I'm working on my decisions that are being made in half court offense, I want to start in the phase before it of transition offense. If I'm working on the decisions I want to make in transition offense, I actually want to start in defense. I always want to start in the phase of game ahead. That's with an expert. With I'm starting with the novice, I need to start them more in the phase they're in. And again, to get their attention on the right thing at the right time and get them to understand the patterns that we're seeing here. If I give them too much, it goes out the window. So I would start with things like giving a language of how we just want the defense to play. So here I have a beside. Now you can see in beside that she's running with her back to it. We could have a sag or more like a pack to back off. We could be behind the offensive player or support for me for, I always tell when we say support, it means you're in what you would think would be perfect position. Now on the ball, we can be sag, hand pressure, body pressure, okay? Or then we could be beside or behind all those things. But we just randomly start with some scripted defense, and now we create a roadmap for those players to have to read. And now, again, I want them to have the courage and willing to make take the risk. And I love this concept that Doug Lemock talks about, it, the wicked environment. And what he means by the wicked environment is sometimes you're going to make the bad decision, and it turns out right. And then there's going to be other times you make the right decision and it's going to turn out bad. It's only through giving them hundreds and thousands of repetitions that it balances out that they start to understand the roadmap. And I think we have a tendency to try to overcorrect too early in the learning process every single possession. Let them get some reps in and let before you start giving too much feedback on it right away. Let the environment over time help them. Now, if it's some of those specific things, like I said, their, their mechanical problems or positional problems are not seen, that I would fix. But the, the, the touch on their pass, the distance on their pass, should I have bounced it? Let them try those a little bit, okay? And encourage some risk-taking. And then I always like this idea, structure creativity with limitations. So, uh, the structure is the positioning. I always think we have to give positioning, or as Peter said, the landmarks for the geography. The creativity is in how they're going to solve the problem. I'm going to give them some leeway there. What I call limitations is, let's say there's five type of passes they can make. I may say to them, for now, let's just concentrate on these two, maybe three, because that's going to help you get more confidence and your teammates to trust you more. And you don't have to think as much. And then as you get better, then we'll add the third. It's the same thing if I was teaching like ball screen defense. I'm not giving them 10 different ways to defend right away. For you right now, let's just start with these two. And then as they gain confidence and become more of an expert in that, when we can load in something else. I think sometimes, as Peter talked about, we give way too much tacticals, too much stuff. And we try, and, and as a coach, we know all these great tactics, but you got to remember, a player's working memory only has so much they can handle. And until they put some of that into their long term memory, be careful on how much you load in. The next piece is this is just, again, how I kind of guide in small sided games. So if we were working on, say, there's going to be a two player action over here. So we're, we're going to have a dribble handoff. So we're working on a DHO or Alex is on here, calls them Zooms. So they're working on a DHO on this side. So what we wanna do is, first of all, in the action decision-making is, am I gonna keep it? Am I gonna pass it? Or am I gonna shoot it? That's the three decisions you got. And then how do you layer in deception? That's the points of emphasis I'm gonna work on, being deceptive. Defensively, I call it do's and days. So 
I don't use that with the players a lot, just to help me remember. So they, a dues means they can go, uh, I'll get it up here. So we'll start with the days it has there. I can disrupt, I can stay attached, I can extend or I can switch. And then the dues means I can disrupt, I can go over, under, or switch. So either I'll let the defense decide, you two get together and come up with the two ways you're going to defend this. Or I may say, look, you're, you're either switching or you're both disrupt, trying to disrupt. Just be, dis, be disrupt and let's disrupt early. Let's be disruptive early before they get to the action. Okay, so that probably means they're gonna top block. They're gonna really try to get up in body. They're gonna take away whatever. The one I don't think we do a good job on is this out of the action decision-making. Are you gonna be in space and where is it? Are you going to cut or seal? Or are you gonna screen and pick? And then are you gonna be screening and picking outside the action? Or are you gonna be screening or picking inside the action? And then the off ball de defenders, it's your PVED. Where do you need to be posi positioned? What do you need to be seeing? What are you anticipating when you make your decision? As I always say, AWP, you got to arrive with a plan. You must have a plan on defense. And it is constantly changing. Every time there's a movement of a player and a ball, you are now moving to a new position with a new plan. You're constantly talking. You're constantly moving. So from this, since it's the passing, we have to have some way that we can track and monitor our passing. So we're going to use some kind of thing where we're keeping track of what it is that we're focusing on. Is it the number of completed passes? Is it the number of pass passes? Is it the number of passes that led right to a, a next action? Is it encouraging certain types of passes? Whatever you think your point of emphasis, that's what you need to be monitoring in that drill. And that's where I use either like Alex, and you've talked about this all the time, but some kind of code or am I using a golden snitch? Like when Peter said the idea that uh, when the team got two consecutive closeouts or two good closeouts in a drill, that to me is a golden snitch. A golden snitch to me is when your team achieves the point of emphasis in a drill, they win the drill. Doesn't matter what the score is, you win the drill when you achieve the point of emphasis. And, and it's again, it's to get the folks on the right thing at the right time. And then again, making sure it's a safe learning environment. Is it okay to take risks? That's why we have practice to take risk. Practice should not look perfect. It is not about performance and practice, it's about learning because that's what will transfer, okay? So just a couple things on teaching passing. And I did a session for, I can't remember who in Europe about inbounding and teaching decision-making through inbounding. Inbounding is a great way to teach simple concepts of skills because it's static. And it, it's, it's like playing baseball. I can, I can predict what I'm gonna do ahead of time. Okay, so we're playing one-on-one. -on -one. You must catch the ball, whoops. You must catch the ball in the yellow box. Okay. And then I can tell which basket. They may score at this basket, but in this drill, probably they were gonna score at the far end. But I can decide which basket or they can decide, they'd have to know. So one of the first things we want the player to do is, is what's some of the underlying principles? And at first, I'm not gonna give them any principles. I just wanna check for understanding and see what they do. And then usually what I would do is look for a player that is doing something that is that fits what I think is a good principle. And then we'll get them to demonstrate to the others and say, Johnny and, and Bill, you go again. And I want to watch what Johnny's doing. And then hopefully what we're gonna to start to see is Johnny's gonna to start to recognize how he's being defended. And what he's going to do is he's going to start to enlarge his space. So number, number one realizes, oh, he's playing behind me. Number three in the red is playing behind me. Well, I don't want to start as close to the ball. I want to get as far away from the ball as possible to make the space in which I can catch the ball as big as possible. That is a number one principle of a receiver in football and basketball. Enlarge your space to give a bigger window for the person to pass the ball into. And yet I don't see a lot of people teaching how to enlarge space. And it's a simple concept. That, and players can go their whole career and never get it because no one ever told them to them. They just thought they had to get open because they were running a pattern that their press break was or their offense was instead of understanding. 
If I just enlarge my space, it's going to be easy to get into that space. The second key is going to be that timing and sequence. When do I cut? So I would let them play again, and I'd be watching for somebody who cut when they was eye contact. And as ah, there's somebody who understands the concept of when to cut. Too many kids cut before there's eye contact, and now they're standing still. Defense is still running, runs through them, steals the ball. So helping them understand where I should position myself, how I'm going to move, and what's the timing in the sequencing. Okay. This one is always an interesting one for me against pressure is throwing over the top. I did a clinic one time and it was in Saskatoon. And I was talking to the coaches and I had this, this player come out and guard me. And she denied me and I walked down just like this. So I was player one and I walked the defender right down and they were almost standing on the baseline. And I'm showing my target hand and the player wouldn't throw me the ball. And I'm standing there like I'm open and she would not throw the ball. So I stopped and I said to the crowd, I said, that is not her fault. That is my fault as a coach because she doesn't think I'm open because she always thinks open in all her passing drills. She doesn't practice or on air. And she, when she sees a somebody with two hands like this, that's open. She doesn't understand that there, because there's a defender between her and me. And if she throws it over the top, I'm open. She's not learned that concept. That is a, an amazing thing. And this was probably like 15 year olds. So, so to me, they need to learn open is not always mean that somebody's standing there, but you can throw over people, over defenders. And if you're going to attack pressure, that's important. Then the third concept is how do you seal to get open? Sealing, it's not always a cut. It could be a seal. And there's a big difference between sealing to get open and cutting to get open. So the example here was that this was Nigeria versus USA. So she's sealing. So the key is who moves first? Does the ball go first or does the player cut first? Well, for me, it's pretty straightforward. If I'm sealing, the ball has to move first. Because if I release my seal, the defender has a just as great a chance to get the ball as I do. And yet I see it, it gets sealed passes get stolen all the time because the, the offensive player, the receiver moves first. The second thing is, if she throws this ball on a straight line, it's hard for me to know when to the timing and sequencing of when I should release. If she puts a little bit of an arc on this, I know when the ball's at the point of its arc, that's a good time for me to release. Or if she throws a bounce pass, as soon as it hits the floor, I can release and I will get the ball every single time if I've sealed the player properly because the defender can't get it. But if you throw me a straight bullet pass, that's sometimes hard when I'm sealing to know when to, to cut to get the ball. Now it's different. Oh, we got to clear that. That's different here. Here we need on a cut, she needs to move first and she needs to be given a target as to where that ball is going to be. And it's not, I'm not throwing to her. I'm throwing to a spot where the ball and the player are going to meet. And again, I find in, in our country, girls who have played soccer and hockey understand that better than girls who just were taught basketball. They know how to lead somebody on a pass. There's a lot of young players who just pass out the person, but getting very detailed. Remember we talked about an expert understands the detail. I know I'm leading to an exact spot in space that I'm throwing that ball to, not just throwing it over there somewhere. And then the other one is, is that again, this can be a little more of a direct pass. But the, the cue of the timing, this is eye contact. There needs to be a connection with the eyes between these two players. Because I could do a fake first, and then I see she looks, I win the short race. And to me, you, anybody can win the short race if I know where, the, I know where the, I'm running to, and I know the starting time. If it's a long race, the fastest player wins. Okay, passing versus pressure. This is just an old classic drill. Six on three. And basically, when the ball's in the front court, it's it's these four against these three. When it gets over half, it's these four versus the three. And then what I usually do is when it when it's scored down here, the black team quickly sets up their six people, three reds that attack it. And so it's just continuous. 
But what we're trying to do is really teach the concepts. Whoops, I gotta go back. It's the concepts. And to me, the concept is building triangles. First of all, if we cut here to get the ball, we want to build a triangle. What a lot of players will do is they'll just cut into here. The problem with that cut sometimes, it now allows these defenders and you've actually shrunk the space. So to me, what we want to try to do is more where, I'll just undo those a little bit, is we want more that you're trying to, sometimes at first the thing you want to do is get behind these people. And now they may have to actually back up. Or when you make eye contact, you can now cut into the space instead of them taking away the space where they see you. So helping them understand how we build triangles and how we can enlarge space, how we know the timing to cut. Very good for just teaching concepts of passing against pressure. Another one that this is what I used to call with my little club team was, this is what I'd call my ed drill, my every day. We would do this one every day. We would play three on three. I'd have one group at this basket, one at the other basket. And we played three on three, keep away inside the key. I let them have early in the year, I let them have one pivot foot. They could pivot as long as both feet didn't go outside the key. As the year went on, you had to have both feet in. But basically what it taught them was in small space was, how to screen and how to separate on a screen, how to space pivot and how to lead somebody with a pass who is being sealed. It is not easy, but once they learn it, they get real good. It also got the defense to work on how to defend screens. Big space was more about, can you cut to get open? Can you fake to get open? And can I deliver a pass on time on target? Now, normally what I would do is in the small space one, you, you had to complete maybe four passes, five passes of Hermie, then you're allowed, to, then it's live to score. Same in the big space, so many passes and then it's live. Well, then what I start to do is you had to get three passes in small space, quickly go get three passes in big space, and then it was live. And then we played transition, and then the other team got a live transition, then we'd stop and start it at the other end. And I found it was a great way just to help them continue to focus on and do where we maintaining how to get open for passes, how to deliver on time on target passes. Passing in zones. Uh, Peter talked about you're going to see more zones. And I find that players who just put the ball over their head and stand and stare. So we, I would do a lot of drills where it was, and this is old, old, uh, Oh my goodness, Del Harris stuff from his original book on zones, not the one that him and Ken just wrote, but it was all conceptual and was one of the best coaching books I ever got. And it was just, we went a diamond against the box and a box against the diamond. But what we were learning was again, how to create space. Like this player here has an awful tendency to cut in here. Well, what I would always try to teach is no, you're now making it hard for your, your quarterback, your passer. What a good receiver understands is against the zone is I want to step here and put this defender on my back. So now the quarterback has a space that they can throw to. And it's very easy for the quarterback to understand where to throw the pass because you've given me the space to throw to. But when I step in between the two, I have to now think about can both of those players can steal the ball. So we would spend a lot of time and just help know where to step to create a space in which to pass, okay? And against the diamond, we always said that this is the diagonal pass that beats the zone. And again, it was learning how to, how to fake. So when the ball was here, this player's out, this player's in. And if it was Pat and you're behind, if this player's back, you gotta go out, you gotta go in. But just getting them understanding those subtle concepts of creating windows, faking, and enlarging your space to make the pass. And then this was probably my favorite one that I would do if I had a pregame shoot or if I had a the, the day before the game. It was just called reversal passing. But basically this player would toss it off the backboard, outlet pass. But then as soon as it went here, we were now on offense. So think of it as your 14 second offense. But they had to get a full reversal 
And then whatever we thought we were going to be focusing on for that game, we would go into after the reversal. So maybe it was going to be come over and run a post up and we were going to do a post feed and we were working on our split action off the post. Maybe it was going to be dynamic one and drive and we were working on drift, you know, circle cut and fill behind. Maybe we were going to work on a high post back screen into a ball screen. Whatever the concept or action we were practicing, that's what we could turn this drill into. Or whatever action the other team was going to run, they would run. And now the defense was focusing on it. But I found it was a great way to practice the passing that we had to be able to make in crunch times against good pressure, pressure defense. So again, it was just a way to really put our focus on the right thing at the right time. Okay? And really, Mike, that's all I had to, to go with, except I wanted to always finish with a debrief. And what I'd like people to be able to tell me is what went well, what could I have done better, and what's something they learned. But I'm also open to questions. Uh, that, that's that's some great stuff, Mike. And and uh, really, I already had thought provoking. Uh, like it was already thought provoking because passing. Like um, I was discussing with Paul Kelleher on on uh, uh, before um, about topics and. and the amount of coaches teaching about passing or um, like explaining it in, in the way I like to teach passing is, is, is to a minimum. Because when it comes to passing, you see the guys standing in lines across each other, giving bounce passes, giving chest passes, just, oh yeah, we're gonna pivot outside and we give a, a pass that way. Like it, it, it's not relatable to the game in any form of means. Well. I would I would challenge you, Mike, that there is some of that required with the novice. So let's let's say things like throwing a ball long. Now, again, I coach a lot of female players, and if I want them to learn how to throw a long outlet pass, like a baseball, I call a football pass, or a breakout dribble pass off the dribble. Biomechanically, there's some things there you've got to do. So so what I do is I hide it in. I had the veggies and the spaghetti sauce. I hide it in warm up. And when I used to coach my quarterbacks, and I explain this to people all the time, if I want a quarterback to get better at throwing, I had to do what was called long toss. You didn't get better at throwing a ball far if you only threw 10 yard passes. You actually had to get them to throw a little further than what they're comfortable for to work on extending their range. Well, it's the same thing. I need to have my, the, so what I do in practice, you know how you do movement prep and you have people jogging across the floor? We would just have everyone say, okay, quickly, baseball passes. Do another movement prep. Okay, quickly, football passes. Okay, breakup passes. We just hide it in there. But think about it. It's still, you're throwing long. You're still coordinating your body. You're warming up like for a baseball game, but it's, they didn't know that. But now all of a sudden when I went into my transition, there's a much better chance that they might transfer some of that how to throw into the actual practice. So I, I sneak that stuff in while I can. The other one is this whole idea of blocking and trapping. I do a lot of stuff with tall post players or all young. They're wall dribbling, right? But then with their other arm, they have to be sealing me or sealing a partner. That is not an easy skill because most things we do, we, our, our hands want to do the same thing at the same time. So it's like patting your head and rubbing your belly. One arm has to be catching a ball. The other one has to be holding someone off. We can't, you can't just assume that, oh, they'll, they'll discover that. So I, again, I sneak that in a, in a warm up. Yeah, I agree. So uh, coach Kevin had a, had a question in the chat. Kevin, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> First of all, thank you guys for sharing. This has all been really valuable content for me. Um, I was just curious your thoughts on teaching passing. I've always gone back and forth of doing it in a more, general way kind of some of the drills you showed versus making it more context specific to whatever system of play you have of kind of how you balance the two especially with Doug Lamov's book of a lot of skills being very context specific that maybe a general passing doesn't translate to the plays you run as much as if it was um, fit a little better well what I tried to show was remember when I showed where I had them randomly placed or I gave them the, the different decision-making, there's no question. I probably do more of that as my team gets better. 
like it's much more context specific. But the first ones, the the one on one, that's maybe like the first day of two of practice. Then I'm probably we're doing that. I then expect that to transfer into if I go four on four, full court or five on five. I'm expect I don't have to go back to that drill. The three on three ones, I find that they're just a great warm up to get focus. But it goes luckily, okay, you just gotta get three in the small space, three in the big space, and then we're playing. Then you're allowed to score play. So it's just a check for understanding to make sure that they're still it's still there. But as the year goes on, it's much more, as you just said, the contextual. But I have problem, I have if I go right to the game's approach, they don't have they don't have the tools in the toolbox sometimes to become creative, to actually they don't they'll just do what they always do they'll just put their head down with the right hand and they'll just do the same pass to the same person in front of them every single time so i have to give them other options or or, or examples of things that they can do that's just my thoughts on it as i go from that novice to expert very good point though it's it's the thing that i think about all the time could could you talk a little bit more because i thought you brought up a great point with the there is a huge push towards game-based approach teaching stuff and I've thought similar to you that if they don't even know what their options are um, or potential solutions are they may struggle to find ones or they'll just go with what they're comfortable versus if you script it a little bit more and then put them in it then they know what to do that's why I use the term structured creativity with limitations creativity creativity is one of these words I think I think that gets overblown I don't think that somebody's going to invent a new way to shoot. Some kid in some three-on-three game all of a sudden comes up with suit, some new way to shoot or some pass that we've never thought about. It's, it's usually creativity is I'm expanding on a concept or I'm linking different concepts in a unique way or an elaboration on something. But if I don't have anything in my toolbox, what am I going to elaborate on? What am I going to link together? And I'm, I, I've coached from people who've never played before to people who are playing for gold medals in the Olympics, I hope. And all I know when I'm with a whole bunch of young kids who've never played, never seen the game, they have no frame of reference. They're immigrant children. They've, they've never seen basketball. If I say, okay, we're playing three on three and let's be creative. Like what? Now, having said that, if you saw that one-on-one I was playing, I'm not giving a lot of instructions. I'm just saying, you got to get open when you get the ball. That's your basket score at play. And now I would more structure it that way. And I would always start that way instead of saying, okay, you're with a partner. You're standing there doing chest passes for half an hour. Then you're doing bounce pad. Then you're, and that, okay. And if you do really good, we'll let you play. No, that one's gone. That, because they're off playing another sport. So I would lean towards more, a games approach, but I think every once in a while you've got to sneak in some veggies in the spaghetti sauce on how they might be able to do it. Okay, and that goes back. Remember that confidence with that young girl and throwing a ball. And I think a lot of times people understand. I'm not going to do something people laugh at me or make fun of me. So I want to look like a player. Like I know of young female players, if they have a shot that doesn't look like a shot, they're not shooting it because people are going to laugh at them, and I'm not having people laugh at me. So that's just my experience of coaching for about 40 years is uh, I'm still going to put some skill teaching in. Yeah. And I, I thought Lamov's book was one of the best ones on coaching too, that I've read of even the idea of like um, doing those basic skills, dribbling, passing to where they're automated, frees them up to be creative. Um, yeah, after- but I'll, ch- I'll challenge you on that one, Kevin, is that, or, it does do I self-organize into doing the same thing all the time and I'm not okay that's the problem that's always the balance because if I always just dribble with my right hand picture picture the boy who's physically mature early and I can just put my head down drive the basket with my right hand jump stop power it up get my rebound on the miss power it up again and finally score and I run back down the defense and I do that every single time there's not another kid in the gym can stop me is he making a decision or is he just doing a habit over and over? And then finally somebody actually gets good enough to take that away. Is he able to free up his working memory to have another option or is he get frustrated because he can't, doesn't know what to do. 
So it's, there's always a balance on that one too. Um, and, and, it's, and that's why I've always got to be watching how people are self-organizing and then how do I challenge them to that next level of what they need to put their attention on. Okay. Yeah. But you're right. If I can't automate, uh, automate, make it automatic, in other words, if I can bring a ball up the floor without looking at you and I know how to change speeds and change direction and, and I'm not and I can look through you to, to perception of like that's what we want. I want to be able to take my my skills and, and, and put my pers- my uh, working memory on perception. That's what the great players can do. They're not having to think about the geography that Peter talked about or that dribbling like you just talked about. And I can focus on perception and pattern recognition, right? But if I have to think about how I'm dribbling in the last seconds of the game, we're in trouble. For sure. Thank you. Jack, uh, Jack, mate, could you unmute yourself, please? Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, Mike, I just had a question around um, how do you balance that detail between novice and experts when you've got maybe a player who's far more uh, talented or maybe on the other end, really struggling um, with what you're asking for within the means of the group without singling them out or uh, embarrassing them. That, that's, again, the art. And that's why, if you've heard me talking to some of the other things, is we're really trying to focus on this whole idea of the IPP, the Individual Performance Plan too. So, so, so one is I think you have to look at how you match people up in practice. Don't let them always partner up. So I can look at who I partner you against. I can also look at, remember I said I got, I had three groups or say I had six, this sense six at that end. I can, I can judge that one too, right? But what I've tried to build in it is again, is this, is look, when I coached high school, the best thing that I did was open up the gym in the morning and the girls could come in from say seven in the morning to about 8.30 before they had to get ready for school and start at night. And I had some girls that came in every morning from September to June, and they would be there for about an hour and a half. I'm serious. Well, I wasn't there with them for an hour and a half because I had all kinds of kids and I was doing football players stuff, but that 10 to 15 minutes that they got every day on individual work, that was the me throwing the baseball with them, right? And you could really get, build trust and build confidence. So my thing, when I ever had that player at the lower end, it's like, just come in. Let's let's get you in for some work in the morning. We'll we'll work on that. And they knew that that was going to help them a lot. Fast forward now, I don't have access to the gym with my club team. I can't do that. I was the athletic director. I had I controlled the gym. I, that doesn't happen anymore. So what I would always do is first of all, I went to my club and I always found out what happens in Canada a lot is the schools have the gyms until six o'clock, and then it turns over to the community. So I would always say can we get the first slot? And then I would go to the school and I'd find out what are the days that you don't always have the gym booked right up to six. And I would find out. And then that, I said, well, we want to have Tuesday nights because then I knew if I get in at five 30, some nights, there was no one in the gym. And I just tell someone, hey, let's just show up at five 30. And a lot of times there's no one in the gym. So we had that half hour for IPP. Or I would try to get the one at the end and I would always check with the janitor because you have to know your janitors. And I'd say, if I just stick around for like 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, would you mind? He says, ah, oh, I cleaned the gym last. You're okay. But I also make sure I give him a present or, you know, you do something. To... But so now I could turn that into IPP. If I couldn't do that, I built in IPP times in practice. So that first five to 10 minutes to me is IPP time. And some coaches said, well, yeah, but you got to get started right away. I said, look, I would rather that I spend that quality time and just going around with each kid and getting to check with, check in with them than just starting right away and not checking in with them. And then I'd also build in some IPP times during practice where they would go in groups or with it. But I may say, Hey Jack, let's just, you and I come over here for a second. Let's just work on this for a bit. Or right at the end, just say, Hey, let's just go over and review how to get over that ball screen to build your confidence. Right. So it's, it's really around that sort of things, but, but also in drills on how I, I give limitations. So, I, or I may say that in, in a certain drill that like in using Peter's idea of the closeouts, I may say it's a certain players got to get certain close, but you may not be one of them. 
or I may say that, you know, if you do certain things, it's worth this many points and that, like I can also layer it in that way too. Thanks, Mike. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for this valuable uh, information. My question, Coach Mike, is that uh, should behind the back or no look passes be taught or just wait for the player to do it during practice and whenever he or she makes the mistake, we jump in and correct? First thing, I would never discourage it. Like I wouldn't, to me, it's the concept. If it fits the concept, I'd, I'd be like running over double high fives. Woohoo! My fear, especially on the girls' side, girls are not as likely to imitate what they've seen in a game as guys. Um, look, when I first came to Toronto was when, when Vince Carter and I'd go in to work with a bunch of guys and every single one was doing a fall away with their leg kicked out. And I'd be like, well, well, the Raptors played last night and everybody's watching Vince. And if you go into a gym now, what do you see everybody doing? They're doing step back threes because they're watching hard. You don't see as much of that from the girls. Okay. So with guys, you more, you, you, I mean, I'm not saying you don't see it, but it's just not as likely. And with this, the sports net or sports, these clips, you get to see those kind of highlights. So they're much more likely to see them. When I was first started playing and coaching, there was no basketball on TV. So I remember the first time I saw a reverse uh, dribble was we got to see a little bit of a Knicks game with Earl Monroe and he did a spin dribble. Well, me and my buddies are like, oh my goodness, like, what was that? But when we tried it, our coach said, don't be pulling that stuff around me. We're never going to do it. Well, that meant when we went to the, the Oak Door Court, that's all we practiced was a spin dribble. But we never did it around our coach. So I think it's 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 if they do it celebrate it but make sure and this is my thing about being creative too is it's great to be creative but it must solve the problem so i can throw behind the back pass but if i could have just done it easy with another pass and it was more effective and efficient then why are we doing it behind the back pass is this just to bring attention no if it solved the problem i'm all over it but if it's like i could shoot the ball under my leg and be creative, but I don't think it's going to solve the problem of scoring more baskets. So that's, but with the girls and sometimes players is like, say like a step back, I would be waiting a long time before a lot of the girls that I work with in gyms are, are, are going to be creative with the step back. So I'm going to teach it and then show them how they can use it and then put them in game situations where they can practice it or, and, and use that creative creative play. And then what I want them to do is build off it and elaborate it and add a step back to a pull, a crossover, a step back to a hesitation or step back to a fake fake. That's where the creativity comes in when they start to elaborate or build off it. All right, guys, we're already running for, for over, uh, over two hours while I asked everybody for two times 45 minutes. So if we all good, I, I, I would say, okay, um, if there are any more questions or anybody wants to answer the triple W's uh, for, uh, or sorry, not the triple W's, but what worked well, what uh, uh, could Mike do better or what could he simply just leave out of his presentation? If somebody has an, a, any thoughts on that as well. Um, One thing I'd like to know, I'm experimenting with this annotation where I draw on things on Zoom. And I'm wanting to know, is that, is that enhance? There's a lot more I can do with it, but I was just gonna tease you with it today because I think there's a powerful tool there in Zoom that we don't use. So does anybody give me a thumbs up that that's, a, that's a, something we should, as a keeper? Okay. I, I, I think I it's- Definitely say thumbs up. I think it's a great tool to add. I think it's better than me switching cameras and showing my whiteboard and X and O and on the whiteboard. I think there's, there's a lot that you can do with that annotate piece of zoom that we're not even tapping into yeah no i fully agree so while saying that i would um stop the the, the recording for now if anybody wants to stay in and, and have a chat or anything like that feel free uh, to stay in and have a chat uh, i will definitely stay in for anybody anybody that would like to talk some basketball uh, but thank you mike uh, as well as peter thank you very very much uh, and uh, we even got I can even say it out loud, right, Jack? We got an announcement for next week, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Jack will be on here next week uh, together with Troy Cully uh, from uh, the GB under 16. So uh, next week, um, 9.30 p.m. Antwerp time, we got Jack and, and, and Troy joining us. 
So without that, with that, I will, uh, yeah, stop the recording and, and let's have a chat, guys.